everybody here today. Powerful name. Let's remember that name, how powerful it is. I think people throw Jesus around like it's just a household name. He can move mountains. He can change your life. He can run demons off. So we have to remember that when we speak of Jesus, it's not the watered down Jesus that many speak of today. He is still king of kings and he is still going to win. The battle has been won. So, I'm sorry, I get off target. This is our prayer book. Uh, if your name's not in here, it should be. Uh, this is not a book of prayer requests. This is a book of names for prayer. We all need prayer, and God knows what. When we pray over this book, God knows what you need, and he knows why we're praying for you, even if we don't. Uh, if, you will, if you're here and you can fill it out, it's over here on the barrel. If you're online, you can mail it in to the church's address, and Pastor Woody will get you a Rockin' Country Church is Praying for Me sticker. This is to remind you and to let people around you know that you are being prayed for by a little church in Kemp, Texas. Um, we may be small, but we're powerful when it comes to prayer. Amen. And uh, if everybody will move your uh, hats, we will go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to come and gather like this. Um, we know in many places in this world that people do gather in small numbers, but if they're caught gathering like this, it means their life. It's not just a, a inconvenience to them. We thank you for the ability to do things like the women's conference, like the men's groups we have and the other things like that. Lord, we just ask that you'll continue to bring the people of the community in, if not to our church, to other churches. Lord, it's about you. We pray that you, they will, you will touch their lives and touch their hearts and draw them to you. We ask that you'll be with Pastor Woody today, that you will lay your hands upon him, that you will fill him with the Spirit and allow him to deliver the message you have given him today, Lord, and just use it to touch each and every one of our hearts. We ask that you'll lay your hands upon our offerings and tithes, Lord, that you will allow the church to use them in the way you see fit, doing your work and doing um, what you've called us to do. We ask that you'll be with all the churches in the community, Lord. We pray that you will just lift up the ones who are teaching your word and that you will touch the hearts of the ones who are not and uh, show them that they should be teaching your word, Lord. And we just pray that you'll touch the people in this community. We pray that you will reach out to them and draw them to you, to one of the churches, wherever it may be, Lord, because we all need you, Lord, and it's some people just don't realize it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen. Where is it? Good morning, Rockin' Country Church. I lost my water. I mean, how do you lose something? Oh, there it is on the floor. How in the world do you lose something within three feet of you, right? Oh, well, that's me. All right, good morning again, once again, and glad to be here. Glad everybody is here that is here. I wish those who didn't make it were here, but, you know, it's what it is. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of real, real quick announcements. One is, is that Miss Bridget, will you raise your hand, please? Miss Bridget has decided to rededicate herself to the Lord, so in two weeks we will have a rededication in her honor. Amen? All right. God bless you, sister, and welcome to the congregation of Rock and Country Church. Uh, I also want to remind you of our business meeting today. Uh, if you want to know what we do and how we do it and what we plan, which we've got lots of stuff planned, uh, come to our business meeting. It won't take very long, but, uh, you know, a couple hours, three or four or five, something like that. Be all right. But, no, it'll just take a little while. But if you can join us in our business meeting today, please do so. Uh, if you want to know what's going on with the church and where we're headed and what we're planning on doing, be there. Be there, be square. You know what we said in the 60s and 70s, right? All right. So we don't want to be square. All right, uh, the other thing I want to mention real quick is our, of course, uh, it was already mentioned, but our anniversary, we're celebrating 11 years, 11 years. You know, that's, that's, a lot of people don't realize it, but that's a milestone for a church because uh, you'd be surprised at how many churches are started every year, every year, and how many close every year. Quite a few, far more than we, than should, but that's just what happens, so uh you know, your church is still going strong, and we're uh, financially sound, and uh, we give a credit to the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, uh, and then the last thing is, uh, of course, 9-11. Uh, we actually started the church around uh, the 21st of August. Is either the 21st or 23rd. We started right around there, but we didn't get organized and formed and get our first meeting and all going until our first true meeting going until uh, right at 9-11. So that's why we, and it's easier to remember, right? 
so that's why we uh, celebrated on 9-11. But, you know, 11 years of, uh, of sharing fellowship with you guys and you learning the word, me learning the word, and just growing closer and closer and closer to Christ. I mean, it's been such an honor and a privilege to, to be your pastor and such an honor and a privilege to be a part of your life. And uh, I thank you for being a part of mine, okay? So God bless you. God bless you. I really appreciate that. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and uh, we'll get on with our teaching today. We're going to be in the book of John, the gospel of John, starting with, uh, we're going to, our scripture is not John 1, but we're going to start in chapter 1. So if you want to go ahead and open those real quickly, or let's pray it up first, and then we'll open them, and we'll get started as the kids just get dismissed, okay? So let's pray it up. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord, and we truly thank you for being with all those families who are remembering 9-11 in another way, Lord. All those families who are affected uh, by uh, the towers being destroyed and almost 3,000 lives being lost, innocent lives being lost. Father, we lift up all those families and, and uh, all those who are involved, including the first responders, and we ask, Lord, that you uh, be with them and give them comfort because today is going to be a tough day for them to, uh, to uh, remember. We celebrate the birth of our church, if you will, or the, uh, the uh, annual celebration of, of our church's existence. But we've we got to remember, Lord, that you started the church back some 2,000 some odd years ago. And so we're just a continuation of you. And we ask you, Lord, that you can empower us today to continue bringing the gospel, bringing forth Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to our communities, to our countries, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our families. And we lift them up to you, Lord, and we ask them to be receptive to your word today. We ask you again, Lord, to touch those lives who were affected by the 9-11 up in New York City and all those throughout the world and give them comfort and peace during this time. Let them rejoice. Let them rejoice, Lord, knowing that someday we will meet, hopefully meet those people again, and we'll see them in all their glory that you have promised each and every one of us who believe in you. We give you all praise, honor, and glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's dismiss the kiddos. Our scripture is not John 1.1. 1, 1. Though we're going to share that, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to give you our scripture as far as the actual scriptures, and then we're going to study from there. Our scripture today is actually John 1, verses 6 through uh, 9, 6 through 8, 6 through 8. Most of the people, whenever we talk of John 1, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, they think, oh, yeah, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is all true because it's right here, and we're going to talk about that. But the Scripture that most people oversee and overlook and just kind of take for granted, if you will, are the Scriptures that we're going to use today. And we're going to talk about those Scriptures, John 1, 6 through 8. Last week, we be, I began talking with you a little bit about witnessing for Christ and how God, the Father, the Old Testament Scripture, we call it the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, the Moses Bible, the Jewish Bible, if you will, and the works of Christ testified to Jesus as Savior and as the begotten Son of God. Begotten meaning from God, directly from God. That was in John 5, 16 through 47. My question was to you then, and still is to you now, will you be a witness? Will you be a witness to the world that we live in today? Will you be a witness for Christ? It is your calling on your life, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, whether you want to accept it or not. It is the calling as a Christian to be Christ-like and to do and continue the work that Christ has given us to do by his example. So we are to go out into the world and be a witness to Jesus Christ. I'd like to share with you the example of a particular witness today from the scriptures. Our scripture is again, again is John 1 verses 6 through 8. There was a man 
sent from God. Sent from God. Realizing, I hope you do, that you are sent from God. You're called. Oh, what do you mean? God hasn't called me. You would not be a Christian if God had not called you. That's what Scripture says. That's what Jesus says. No one comes to his Father unless they are called. So you are called by God to be a minister of the gospel. You're sent from God. You're here for God's purpose, not your purpose. This particular man was sent from God whose name was John. Now, this is John the disciple writing about John the Baptist, who he is speaking of here. This John that he's talking about in Scripture is John the Baptist, not himself. In the Gospel of John, John never mentions his name. Anytime you see the name John in the Gospel of John, he would be talking about John the Baptist and not himself. He always considered himself the one Jesus loved. Not as John. So he's talking about John the Baptist here. Verse 7 it says, This man, John the Baptist, came for a witness to bear witness to the light. He came for a particular purpose. He came to be a witness, to bear witness to the light. And we're going to talk about what the light actually is. That all through him, not John, but the light, all through him, or all through John, I'm sorry, it is all through John the Baptist, all would believe in the light. All would believe in the light. In other words, John was sent here to be a heralder of the gospel or a helder, heralder of the coming of the Lord so that all would believe through his voice, through him ministering to them, all would believe in the light that was to come. He was not the light, John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light. The light itself is the object of God, and John the Baptist is the agent of God. And it is the same way with you and I. You and I are agents of God, or ambassadors of God, Paul calls us. And we are called to share the object of God, which is his son, Jesus Christ, which is the light. Now we say, well, what do you mean he is the light? Well, it's very simple. Go to verse 9. That was the true light. You see that capital L there? which gives light to every man coming into the world. In other words, that light, capital L, is going to bring light to all men who are to come. So not only those men of old, but also you and I today. That light is still shining in our darkened world that we live in, and we are living in a very, very dark world at this time, but that light is still shining. Well, I haven't seen it. Where's the light at? You're the light. You are the light. You are to shine the light of Christ that lives inside of you to the darkened world that we live in. Well, that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? Well, you're just a little light, but we've got what, uh, I don't know, 60 here today, let's say. So we have 60 lights. Well, if you were to light 60 lights, that'd be pretty bright light, wouldn't it? If they're all of one accord. See, whenever I talked to uh, Bridget this morning, I told her this church recognizes only one church. There's many, many, many different denominations, but there's only one church according to the word of God. That word of God is the body of Christ, which is the body of believers, which is all of us. We are one church, and it includes the church down the street, and the church down that way, and the church that way, and the church that way that believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're just one church. So if you put all these congregations together with all these little lights that they have in there, shining in the same accord, shining the same, believing in Jesus Christ, that would be a pretty bright light, would it not? Well, sure it is. Sure it is. And that light is the light that lives in man, which is the light of the world, which is you and us, you and I. Jesus is the original light of the world. He came as a light. 
This is what John is telling us. He came as a light. He was not the light, John. But the light that was to come into the world would be the light for all mankind, for all who are to come. So in other words, if there's, uh, if uh, Billy and Tammy had 3,000 grandkids, okay, Jesus can be the light for those 3,000 grandkids. If uh, Clark and Melissa had 4,000 grandkids, then he could be the light for all those grandkids. He can be the light for as many people as will accept him as the light because the Holy Spirit is also God who is the light and the Holy Spirit is who lives inside of each of us. Over in John 14, 15, it talks about God living in us. God living in us. I mean, do we conceive that? Do we really understand God living in us? Oh, well, I just go to church to get my ticket punched. I go on Wednesday night because that's what I'm supposed to do. But whenever I leave here, you know, I guess I just leave God in church because, you know, I go out and do some stuff that maybe uh, God shouldn't see me doing. Guess what? God sees you doing everything. You're never alone. Remember his promise? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So it don't matter how far you run, he's still with you. You can't outrun him, I guarantee you. So John, the disciple, is telling us that Jesus is the true light, the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world. That means Jesus came into the world, and the world was made through him, through Jesus, but the world did not know him. The world did not know Jesus. Why did the world not know Jesus? Because the world at that time knew God. It did not know Jesus because Jesus had to be born. He had to be born of a virgin. We know the story. And he had to come into the world. And he came into the world as a man, as a, fully as a man, always fully God, but fully as a man. He came into the world, and the world said, well, you're just Joseph's son. You're just Mary's son. You're just a carpenter. You're just a guy. We know your brothers and sisters. We know your aunts and uncles and cousins. You're just a person. Jesus says, no, I am the light of the world. So if you think back or put yourself in their place, they're probably going, who is this nutcase? So again, we go back to chapter 5 that we talked about last week where the Old Testament prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. The, uh, the God himself spoke to the world and prophesied about the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. And the scriptures uh, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit spoke of the, uh, of the coming of the Messiah. Jesus was announced throughout the whole Bible. The whole Bible directs us to Jesus and the coming of Jesus in the Old Testament and the being of Jesus in the New Testament. Everything directs us towards Jesus, who is the light of the world. In chapter 1, verse 1, John the disciple writes, In the beginning, in the beginning, so when is that? It's in the beginning. It's in the beginning. That means before anything else was, in the beginning, there was the Word. Capital W here. And the Word was with God. In other words, Jesus was not created. Jesus was. He just was. Well, how could Jesus just be? The same way that God just be. The same way that the Holy Spirit just be. They are. And they were and are in the beginning before anything else was. And he goes on to say, and the word was God. Oh, well, Jesus can't be God because only God is God, right? No, we believe in the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three are equal God, though all three are different. We explained that, I think, last week. Um, Chris, give him a hand there, will you? 
So we have to understand that in the beginning, there was God. In the beginning was Jesus. In the beginning was the Holy Spirit. If you go back to Genesis 1, and by the way, the Genesis means the beginning. The book of Genesis means the beginning. So over in Genesis 1, how does the Bible start? In the beginning. In the beginning. So we understand that John is really just uh, stating again what Genesis has already stated, which is in the beginning, God was. And the Holy Spirit was there and God, it, Jesus was there. All three were there in the beginning. In verse 2, John chapter 1, verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. There it states it right there, pretty plain and simple. Then it goes in verse 3 and it says, And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. So in other words, absolutely nothing that is was not made by Jesus. Because Jesus is the flesh incarnate God. He is the flesh incarnate of the invisible God. Over in Colossians, uh, I think it's 1 and 19, or 1 and 9, and Colossians 2 and or 1 and 29 or something. Anyway, first and second uh, chapter in Colossians, it tells us that Jesus is the deity, the full deity of all God is in the flesh man Jesus. Throughout Scripture of the New Testament, it tells us over and over and over, Jesus is God. So I had a guy one time call me up on the phone. He says, Do your church, does your church believe that Jesus is God? Or is, does your church believe, and it's not my church, it's God's church, or does your church believe that Jesus is the Son of God? I said, well, Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is God. He says, well, that can't be. I said, well, you need to read your Bible. Because the Bible says it is. So what you're saying is, is that the Bible is lying? Well, did we not just read here in verses 1 and verse 2? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, you see where it says He? It doesn't say it. It says He was in the beginning with God. So there was Jesus the man not knowing him as Jesus, but knowing him as God. In the beginning, Jesus existed. It may be kind of hard to understand, but the word is true. And this is what John is saying over here in 9. In verse 9, it says that this, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. In other words, John is saying everything that Jesus is, is truth. Jesus is the Word. Do we agree on that? Yes? Okay. Jesus is the Word. So if He is the Word and He is the truth, you remember over in John 14 where it says He is the, word, the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus said that Himself. So Jesus is the truth, and, it is, and He is the Word, which is 100% true. Well, I don't believe all of the Bible. Then you can't believe... In Jesus, because Jesus is the Word. I mean, we work so hard to make it difficult, and it's so simple. Jesus is the Word according to Scripture. Do you believe the Scripture? The Scripture is, is uh, um, why can't I think of the words I'm looking for today? Inspired by God himself. By the Holy Spirit. It tells us over and over that it, the, the guys wrote it down as the Holy Spirit directed them. God directed them to write down Jesus. I know this sounds kind of maybe redundant or back and forth or over and over and over, but so many people do not look at Jesus as being the Bible, being the Word. And we have to do that because this is the only truth that we have, which is God's Word, which is Jesus. Well, I just don't agree with all the... It don't matter whether you agree with it or not. You didn't write it. And guess what? You don't get to rewrite it. You don't get to rewrite it. God wrote it down. 
If you want to rewrite the Bible, then go talk to God about it. Let's see who wins. Verse 4, John 1, verse 4. In him was life. Here it is right here. And that life, the life of Christ, was the light to men. You see that? The light, it says of men, but it means the light to men. And then when it says men, it means women as well. But it is simply saying that if you want to know the truth from God, then you have to see the light. You have to light, let the, the word enlighten you. Is that an easier way to understand it? Let the word enlighten you to the truth. And you don't get to dissect it. You don't get to cut it up. You don't get to tear out that page. It's, it's complete. It's 100%. There's nothing needs to be added to it. Matter of fact, don't add to it and don't take from it. There's, Jesus gives us a warning over in chapter 22 of Revelation. Don't add to and don't take from. But believe and receive. It's very, very important. In church, I want you to know, and that's the reason that we do Bible study. We don't, we don't do preaching. We do Bible study. Because if you're not understanding this, then you're missing out on one of the basic fundamentals of our faith, which is based on the Word of God. It's not based on, well, I heard this evangelist say one time. I heard this other guy say one time. No, you need to study and read the Word of God. That's why we do Bible study, you know, what, three times a week? Because we get into the depths of Bible study. In talking with our men out here this, uh, this last week, a couple of guys said, you know, I really enjoy our Wednesday night Bible study because we... We don't just read through, and we don't. We study. We get into the depths of the Word. And it's an open Bible study, so you're welcome to speak too. If we could just get Terry not to talk so much, right? She doesn't talk too much. She doesn't say a word. But my point is, is that we must get into the depths of the Bible. That's the reason we changed to this version is because it's a little bit deeper than what we, had, what we really originally had studied from. It's very, very important that we understand the Word and the complete Word, not part of it, not taking this piece out and putting that piece in, not changing it from here to there, but understanding it the way God wrote it because God wrote it. Because, and that's how we study it, the way God wrote it. In verse 10, he says, John writes, he says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, though the world did not know him. Think about today, friends. Think about today. Does our world know Christ? No, it doesn't. It really doesn't. I have people that I talk to periodically that will come to me, and they say, well, you know, I... I grew up in church and all this, and I believe in God, you know, I, I think it's a, but I'm not sure that, you know, after all, it was all written by men, I'm not real sure I understand. That's the key. You don't understand. Okay? It doesn't mean because you don't understand that it's false. It doesn't mean because you don't understand it's not true. The Bible itself says that it is true. If Jesus is the Word, and Jesus says, I am the Word, uh, the, the way, the truth, and the life, then wouldn't you think the Word is true? Then why do we try to tear it to pieces? Anybody got a clue? It's because nobody has witnessed to them. Nobody has said, look, sit down here with me and let's study the Word. Sit down here and let's see what the Word says. Well, I don't understand that part. Well, let's look it up and see if we can figure out what that part is. You see, everybody comes because somebody witnessed to them. Somebody has witnessed to you. Somewhere down the road, somebody has said, hey, you ever heard of church? Or something, and now you're here. This is what John did. People didn't know who Jesus was. 
He's the carpenter kid. Jesus did not start his ministry until he was 30 years old. 30 years old. In other words, all the way up until he was 29 and 364 days, if you will, before his birthday, they just knew him as a carpenter's kid. The guy who fixed chairs, the guys who fixed uh, tables, the guy who did this, the guy who did that. And just as a FYI, in those days, a carpenter was also considered as a stonemason. Uh, people who actually worked with stone, carved stone, made stone things, etc., etc. So a carpenter not only worked with wood, but he also worked with stone. So he could have been the guy who made the manger that that he he could have been the the guy who made his own bed whenever he was a baby, whenever he was born. I mean. God existed before he was Jesus. He existed before he existed after. He could have been that guy. I don't, we don't know. But my point is, is that they knew him as a simple person, just like they know us as, as simple people. Some people don't know me. Some people don't know this church. Some people don't know you until you meet them, right? So until they met the true Messiah, Jesus, in, at 30, at 30 years old. Prior to that, he was just a carpenter guy. So at 30 years old, this guy who came out of the woodshed, if you will, and says, hey, I'm the Messiah. They're going, what? Are you crazy? Well, actually, if you look through the scriptures in, uh, in I think it's in Mark, it says that his mother and his brothers came to get him because they felt he was out of his mind. His own family says, uh-oh, he's fall off the wagon. He's totally gone nuts. He's totally out there somewhere. We better go get him, bring him back in. So we have to understand that there are people out there who do not know what church really is. There are people who, who, come to, who think they come to church to just sing and say hello to everybody and uh, John, I sure like that shirt. You know, maybe you ought to trade shirts with me. Or, John, I don't like that shirt. I don't think you need to wear that shirt anymore. John, my shirt looks better than yours. Now, I'm just using that as a, for instance, there's people who come to compare themselves with other people. Believe me, if I came here to compare myself to you guys, man, I look like the bum on the street. I mean, all you good people, I'm a sinner, forgiven by grace. All you good people, man, I couldn't hold a candle to you. But see, there's other people who think you go to church for different reasons other than knowing God. So once you come to church, if you will, and you know who God is, guess what your ministry is? To witness. Are you going to be a witness for Christ? If you want to know about John the Baptist and you want to read a little bit about him, you can go over to chapters 1, 2, and 3 of the book of Luke and you can read the, about his, his uh, coming of his birth, his birth, his calling, etc., etc., etc. We're not going to go there, but just if you want to, to learn a little bit more about John the Baptist and his purpose. He, his purpose was to be born for the calling of the Savior, the calling of the Messiah, to let the world know the Messiah, the Messiah is coming. That was his sole purpose. Guess what? It's your sole purpose too. It's your sole purpose too. See, John was a, a witness, a man that says, I don't care what the world does to me. I don't care how the world sees me. I am going to shout the name of Jesus. And you just do the same thing. Now, I know we talked a little bit about this last week, but how many people, if you don't want to raise your hand, you don't have to, how many people this last week actually witnessed to someone last week? Good job, good job, okay? Good job. All right, so we had four or five. Let's say there's 60 in here. Oh, I think I missed somebody in the back. All right, six. All right, so about 10%. Is that right? 10, yeah, 10%. Six of 60 is 10%, right? So about 10%. Well, what if we did it at 
what if this church, this congregation, and the church down the street did it at 100%? Let's say they have 60. That's 120. That light gets bigger, right? It gets brighter. gets bigger. We cover more area, cover more ground. That's what we're called to do. But instead, what we do is, is we go to church. I'm not saying this church, because I know this church is here for one reason, and that's to worship God. Then, we, then this church takes the message out to the world, right? That's right. But let's just say this church came in here, and we did our Sunday thing. Then we went home. Oh, is it Sunday already again? We got to go back there and do that again? No. I've heard this several times this week, uh, this past week. Uh, I think we're here every day. Something's going on every day. Well, guess what? When does church stop? It don't. Church doesn't stop. You know when your church stops? When you go to meet Jesus. That's when your church stops. All right? Other than that, you're supposed to be the church every day, all day long, 24-7, 365. We need to be the church. And there's a promise that comes with our witnessing. A promise to the world. Verse 11, John 1, verse 11. He came to his own. He came to his own, which means he came into the world. He created it, did he not? Did it tell us over there on, in, uh, I think it was in uh, verse 4, that, or th verse 3, that everything that was was created by him, right? So it's, who's, who, who does this world belong to? It belongs to Jesus. Guess what? It ain't yours. It ain't yours. Well, that's my truck out there. No, it ain't. Hey, if he wants that truck, guess what? He can take it right now. Well, if this is my wife. He can't take her. <laughs> yeah, right. Don't think he can. Talk to some of our, uh, uh, our, our family here who, is, who have lost loved ones. Okay? Yeah. It all belongs to him. All of it. Even, even, now this is going to sound kind of contradictory. Even unbelievers belong to him. Why? Because he created them. Now, doesn't mean they're children of God. There's a difference, a difference there that God establishes is that you have to be a, a, a brother or sister in Christ in order to belong to God, to be a child of God. But everything is his, including you, including non-believers. And he's going to Judge everything someday, even non-believers. So, how many of the non-believers that you know of have you missed witnessing to? And again, we talk about this from time to time. I'm not talking about beating somebody over the head with the Bible. We could do that, but we'd probably make fools of ourselves. So don't do that. But how many people, we had six people roughly who's, who said they witnessed this last week. How about next week, let's see if we can have 12. I'm not asking everybody to do it. Let's just see if we can have 12. Make an effort, make an effort to witness to someone. And again, I'm not talking about going up beating them with the Bible. But make an effort to be a witness because I guarantee you, once you do it, it'll be a little easier the next time. Then it'll be a little easier the next time. And then it'll be a little easier the next time. And then pretty soon you're going to be like Kathy over there. And you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, where are you going? Wait, come, 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 come here. Do you know Jesus? I just came to get a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk. But let me tell you about Jesus. You know that song? Let me tell you about Jesus. Woo! He did it for me and he'll do it for you. That's a good song. That's what you're supposed to do. Because Jesus came into the world and the world did not know him. And the world did not accept him. And then he came to his own people. 
his own people, the Jews. This is verse 11. He came down to the Jews, and the Jews did not accept him. And those were God's chosen people. So if he came to the Jews and they did not accept him, which are God's chosen people, and after all, they believed totally in God, right? They were followers of God. They did everything God told them to do, right? Afraid not. That's why they wandered down. They took an 11-day trip in the desert, and they did it for 40 years. It's an 11-day walk, and it took them 40 years because they didn't believe. And then when Jesus came on the scene, they didn't accept him. He came into the world to show himself. God, ooh, that song, it reminded me again that song. God didn't want heaven without you, so he brought heaven down. So God came down to the earth. Say, look, you knotheads, it's me. It's me. It's me. And even his own people didn't accept him. You remember whenever Jesus went to the temple and he started reciting Isaiah in the temple? And the people say, he said, today the spirit of the Lord is on me. The spirit of God is on me. And the other, the uh, Pharisees and all went, who is this God? They did not know Jesus. They did not know God, though they professed to know him. The world still doesn't receive and doesn't acknowledge Jesus. The world today does not. Friends, our calling is needed more today than ever before. Than ever before. In our Bible study on Wednesday night, we're studying the book of Romans. We just started it. I think we got through 18 last night or something, or last Wednesday or whatever. We're fixing to go into a very important part of Romans 1, and you can read this if you'd like. It starts right after 18, uh, which would be 19. And then it goes through about verse 30. And this is very, very paraphrased. But the Word of God tells us, and the Word of God is true. Do we agree on that? The Word of God is true. So the word, God, the word of God tells us that God has made himself known, just as we just read. He came to the earth. He made himself known to all people, all people, even the little pygmies in New Guinea or whatever people refer to. God has made himself known to all men, so man is without an excuse. He is without an excuse. They're, oh, well, I didn't know. You do know. Well, you might not know everything about it. You may not understand everything, and neither do I. But you do know God. You do. Well, nobody's ever told me. It doesn't matter. God has, it says that God has made himself known to all men. If we believe Scripture, then guess what? God has made himself known to all men. Therefore, man is without an excuse. Now, this is where the Scripture is going to take us into today. In chapter 24, it starts talking about the ways of the world and the way the world is. And we can see exactly what chapter 24 and 25 tell us and look at our world today and we can see it. And it only gets worse. Back in the 60s or so, remember, for those of us who remember, we had free love. Peace, no war, you know, love everybody. Put a flower in the end of a barrel, you know, on and on and on. The hippy dippy days. All right? Those were good times. We thought. We thought peace, love, and a little on the side, right? We all we all had our free will that God gave us, right? And we can just do whatever we want to because we love everybody. Crime still went on. People died. People killed each other. On and on and on. It didn't change anything. But right after that, we started having a sexual revolution. Actually, it was during that time. We started having a sexual revolution in, in, our, in our world. Free love. Love anybody who you want. You know, 
in this door, out that door type thing, all right? That's the way it, that's the way it was. That's the way our, our world thought. That's in Scripture. That's Romans 1, 24. In Romans 1, 26, and it talks about lesbianism. And over in Romans 1, 26, it talks about homosexuality. After our sexual revolution, we began to have a, a influx, if you will, of lesbianism and homosexuality. It's in the Scriptures. It's in the Bible. It's in Romans 1, 20, uh, 24 through 28. And then when you get over into 28, 27, 28, and 29, it says, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, what does that mean? Put simply, he puts us in or, or gives us over to a mind or a thinking or a reasoning, if you will, that does not line up with him and says a girl is a boy and a boy is a girl because they want to be. And we're there right now. Well, my child can, can uh, be whoever he wants to be. He can choose to be a boy or a girl. She can choose to be a boy or a girl. <coughs> a reprobate mind is a mind that doesn't make any sense. A reprobate mind is a mind that does not have any reason or any morals. Where are we at today? They just had in Dallas, they just had a guy shoot a guy in the middle of a mall and kill him because he didn't like him for some reason. How many times does that happen? We just had Uvalde back in May. Nine and 10 year old kids were killed. Two teachers were killed. Why? Because a guy did, wanted to kill them. Our, our, our society is to a point because we're so far away from God and don't acknowledge God and don't realize God and don't follow God and don't love God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we don't even think about killing somebody. Our world is going to hell in a handbasket. Our nation is going to hell in a handbasket. And we're making laws. This is in Romans. Romans 8, I believe it is. We're making laws saying it's okay that good be evil and evil be good. We're allowing that to happen in our world, in our societies, in our churches. Now, I know when Jeff Diffie was here, he talked about loving each other. And we are to love each other. We are to love the sinner. We are to love the homosexual. We are to love the lesbian. We are to love the reprobate mind people. We are to love them because God loves them. But it does not mean that we allow that kind of immoral activity to influence us. And this is the problem. It has already influenced the world. Because the world does not follow the teachings of Christ. They are living in darkness. In darkness. We're going to look over in John 3, not today. We're going to look over in John 3. We actually talked about it a little bit the other day, or yesterday when we were sitting out here. I believe it's uh, around verse uh, 19 through 24, something like that. Uh, where the darkness has overcome man to the point to where they do not seek the light. Christ is the light. They do not seek the light in fear that their darkness will be known. That's a reprobate mind. That's a, a mind that has no moral thinking. That's a mind that has no concept of love whatsoever do we love people because we oh you told me I was one year old going down the road and so now I'm going to shoot you you cut me off so now I'm going to shoot you oh there's a white car I'm going to shoot in that car because it's fun this stuff happens every day people drive around Dallas and they shoot in a car because it's a car. Because it's a car. There was a little kid. I think he was five years old. He got shot and killed. Because somebody thought it would be cute to shoot into a car. Going down the highway. This is where our society is. Why is our society that way? 
Bible tells us exactly why. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. In other words, we have gotten so far away from the truth and from God that we don't care if people live or die. As long as it ain't us. Oh, well, that happened in Dallas. That's no big deal. That happened in Uvalde. That's no big deal. That happened over in, um, I don't know, Florida, Colorado, California, wherever, Washington. What if it happens in Kemp, Texas? Would we care? We ought to care if it happens in Uvalde, in California, in Washington, and wherever. Well, how do we change this, church? We have to be a witness to Christ. We have to be a witness to the truth. People are, Jesus even tells us this, and he warns us this. He says, people are going to reject you because they reject me. He said, but you don't stop being a witness. If we don't get, if the church, if the church does not get on the stick and, and do what it is called to do, we're going to go to hell faster and faster and faster and faster. And I mean that as a nation. Don't think God won't turn his back on the United States. Don't think he won't. And we're getting, and even our government is saying, no, we don't want anything to do with God. I mean, we got a guy in office right now who professes that he's a Catholic Christian. That's his business, all right? But he believes in abortion. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. And I'm not trying to do the abortion debate. My point is simply this. Are you going to believe the Word of God or are you not? Now, the Word of God says, if you read the Ten Commandments, and we still have the Ten Commandments, we're still not under the law, but we still have the law. Jesus said, no jot nor gentle will ever be removed from the law. So the law still applies. So we have, um, lost my train of thought again. We have a law that says, uh, the Ten Commandments, I think it's uh, number six, I believe it is. It says, it may be seven, it says, thou shalt not murder. Now, there's a difference between war. There's a difference between judgment, such as through our courts and, and uh, the... Um, man, why can't I think of my words? The, um, uh, when, when the judge passes uh, a death sentence on to a person, all right? There's a difference between that and shooting in a car going down the road. Shooting in a car going down the road is murder. War is not murder. When you have someone who is pure evil, I'm sorry to say, whether you believe it or not, the death sentence, you, you have to eliminate that. You have to stop it. Now, if you will say, oh, well, just lock them up, well, then fine, lock them up, but keep them locked up. Don't let them out two years later because they've been good for two years. And that happens all the time. All the time. We as a Christian nation have to step out and say, look, we've got to get rid of the evil. We've got to get rid of the evil. And how are we going to do it? We're not actually even going to do it. God has to do it. God has to do it. But how does God do it? He does it by using you to change the hearts and minds of others. How do you do that? You be a witness. You be a witness to Christ. It is God's desire, it is Jesus' desire, it is the Holy Spirit's desire that none shall perish and all shall receive eternal life and live forever and ever and ever in the presence of God. Again, how many people do you come in contact with that you just kind of walk on by and just let them live their life I get in, argue, not arguments, but I get in discussions with people. And I said, you know, you're, you're entitled to live however you want to live. But I'm not entitled to let you affect my life. I mean, I'm not, you're not entitled to affect my life with your, your, your wanting of, to live a certain way. And I'm not going to allow it. Now, they can have, well, I don't want anything to do with you. Well, bye. See ya. 
And Jesus tells us, he says, you know what? If they don't accept your peace, then check the dust off your feet and move on. I'll be the best friend I can be to you. And if you don't want to be my friend, bye. See ya. Just that simple. But what we, what we do, our country says, oh, no. I'll do whatever it takes so that you're happy. So that you're happy. Guess what? Those people who demand that they have happiness will never be happy because it'll turn around and it'll be something else that they want. And you need to cater to it. It ain't happening, dear friend. Okay, I believe what the Word says. And I try to share the Word with you. Because, look at verse 12. But as many as received him, but as many as received him. And what is that little snippet of a verse saying? If you will receive, if you, if you choose to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there is a guaranteed promise that, is await, that awaits you. What is that guaranteed promise? It says, to them, to those who believe in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To become children of God. You have to change. There has to be something that you become. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. You are a new creation. There has to be a change. You don't just say, oh yeah, well I'm going to be a Christian and you're a Christian. Something has to change in you. You become something you were not. Jesus calls it very simply being born again. Being born again. Over in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, uh, verse, verse uh, whoops, one too many. Verse 3, verse 3 through 7. Let's just share, I'll just share that with you. In verse 3 through 7, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, becomes a child of God, is exactly what he's talking about. You cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean you cannot see the kingdom of God? That means that reprobate mind that you have cannot understand the things of God because you can't comprehend it. You, you can't absorb it. You can't figure it out because you're not going to figure out what God wants if you do not have the Holy Spirit guiding and directing you. Jesus tells us over in John 14, he says, I will send the Holy Spirit who will guide and teach you all things I have told him to reveal to you. So in other words, it is the Holy Spirit is the one that is going to teach us. It's not me teaching you. I'm just showing you what the word says. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of you that is going to teach you and interpret it for you and make you understand it. But if you don't have, if you're not born again, you're not even going to see that you can understand it. And it gets worse, though it's better. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Up there in three, he says, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Here he says you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So in other words, you must be born again in order to understand that you, the reason you're being born again is so that you can enter into the kingdom of God. You cannot walk with Jesus unless you have Jesus. How hard is that to understand? Pretty simple. And he goes on to say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you. In other words, when he says, do not marvel, don't sit, don't sit there and go, wow, I never heard that before. Wow, this is something totally new to me. God has made himself known to all people, so man is without excuse. He said, don't marvel at this. 
you must be born again. You must be born again. So how important is it to be born again? If you want to see the kingdom of God and you want to enter into heaven, you must be born again. That's how simple it is. That's how simple it is. Well, I want to go to heaven. Then you got to be born again. Well, I want to know Jesus. Then you got to be born again. Well, I want to understand the scriptures. Then you got to be born again. Well, I want to know what God says about this. Then you got to be born again. You see how simple it is? Guess what the key to all of that is? To be born again. It's to be born again. But yet we have people. We have people. Yeah, I go to church, but I don't know about getting dunked in that water. They may have been cows drinking out of that water. There's not. Though, if you want to go to the lake, there's dead fish all over that one. I'll dunk in that one. You must be born again. But we know, I hope this church knows, and I know maybe all of you do, maybe, maybe, maybe there's one that doesn't understand. We know to be born again has nothing to do with the water. Okay? I explained, not that she didn't know, but I explained that to Bridget so that she did know whenever I talked to her earlier today. If you have truly received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your heart, then you're born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus just said. That born of the flesh is flesh, and that born of the Spirit is spirit. You must be born again of the Spirit. That means you must accept Christ, surrender yourself, humble yourself, surrender yourself to Christ, and be reborn in the Spirit to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not hard to understand, is it? Pretty simple. But so many people, we, we've, we've joked about this before, but it seems kind of strange to me that people have been in church all their life. Yeah, I got baptized in that church, that church, that church, and that church. When we moved, I got baptized in three more churches, so I ought to be good to go. The water is nothing except your public proclamation showing others what you've already done in your spirit. In your spirit. This is where it is, folks. You want to be born again? Where's it at, Johnny? It's right here, right? It's nowhere else. It's not in that lake. It's not in that trough. It's not in the swimming pool over at the Hamlins, which we've done baptisms there. It's right here. So you have to come to a point. Jesus says, if you want to know about me, Jesus, of course, if you want to see the kingdom of heaven, which is Jesus, because wherever the king is, that's the kingdom, right? All right, wherever the king is, there's the kingdom. And if Jesus is the king, then he is the kingdom. So if you want to know Jesus, you have to be born again. If you want to see him, you have to be born again. If you want to walk with him, you've got to be born again. If you want to, him to talk with you, you've got to be born again. 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 How do you do it? So simple. So simple, but so vitally important. Because if William and I are getting together and we're talking about something, and I'm just going to use you, William. Okay, I know you're, you're a brother in Christ. But if William says, oh, you got baptized? Well, I want to get baptized because you're getting baptized. That's the wrong reason. Well, you know, my uh, mom and dad said, I need to get baptized, so I'm going to get baptized. It's the wrong reason. Well, my wife said I better get baptized or she ain't going to marry me or my girlfriend. Wrong reason. You get baptized because you want to know Jesus. And you want Jesus to be in you and live with you. And then all the promises. Remember when I talked about co-heir and joint heir? Okay. Joint heir means that me and Johnny and John share equal parts. Not the same. We share equal parts. Hey, that's being a joint heir with Christ. But see, we are co-heirs. That means everything that Johnny gets, I get. Everything that John gets, I get. And everything I get, John gets. And everything I get, Johnny gets. And on and on. Everything that Christ gets, you get. And he said he did the right hand of the Father. In heaven. 
What a wonderful place to be. Amen. Well, what if I get baptized next year? What if you die tomorrow? It's too late. It's too late. So we as witnesses, we as witnesses want people to come to Christ, not because it gives us anything, because it builds God's kingdom and it saves them for the eternal hell. Because there's only two places our souls are going to end up. And do you realize that even non-believers are going to have a resurrected body, not a regenerated body, not a regenerated body, but a resurrected body. That means they are going to feel the pain and agony and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth in the eternal lake of fire. If you read over in the book of Revelations where it says in Satan and the Antichrist and the, uh, 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 the um, false prophet were thrown into the eternal lake of fire alive. Alive. And then it says a little bit further on and the non-believers will be thrown in there where they are alive. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. But it's easy to avoid. And I'm not trying to convince you of anything. If you feel the urge to surrender yourself to Christ, then that is the Holy Spirit urging you because God loves you. Not because Woody's saying anything or because Woody used a scripture or anything like that. It's because God loves you so much that he sent his one and only begotten son to pay the price for your sins so that you do not have to suffer the eternal lake of fire, the eternal damnation, the eternal separation from God. So it is God saying, look, John, I'm tugging at your heartstrings, buddy, because I love you, not because I will. Do you think God has got to have you in heaven Oh, yeah, we got to have John. We can't, heaven can't be heaven without John. Sorry, buddy. It ain't that way. But heaven is incomplete without John. Heaven is incomplete without Margo. He's incomplete without um, uh, Kathy. He's incomplete without every one of you. Okay? And so God is saying, come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy burdened, heavy laden, come unto me and I shall give you rest. That rest is not, oh, let's lay back and kick back and kick our feet up. That's not the rest he's talking about. The rest is the rest that you know that your security is safe in the arms of Christ forever and ever and ever. That's, that's the rest that God's got you in the palm of his hand. And that's where he wants you problem is is we get in there and then Monday comes and we jump out Tuesday comes and we jump out and we're wandering around all over the place oh what do I do oh he's not good I can go back and get back in Jesus' hands and then Thursday we jump out again Friday we jump out Saturday comes and oh boy Saturday Woo! man I really fell but Sunday's coming so I can go get back in again it's not the way it works you have to be changed you have to change you have to change you have to become a new creation 2 Corinthians 5 17 you are a new creation the old is gone it is passed away and the new has come because you've been born of the spirit the spirit of God and now he wants you to go out and share that with somebody else as his witness so that they too can come to know the love that God has for them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for each and every day, Lord. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We thank you for all that he has done. We thank you for all that he will do and continue doing, Lord. I pray, Lord, that he will touch our hearts and keep guiding and directing us in, the, in what will glorify you. Let our lives bring you glory, Lord by sharing the gospel, by sharing Jesus Christ with those who will hear us. And those who want, then let, let the Holy Spirit put somebody else in their path. We call that Jack's prayer. Put somebody else in their path so that they may touch their lives and bring them to the knowledge of the love you have for each of us. Father, we give you praise and glory in all things. I ask, Lord, if there's anybody here today who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
that they will surrender themselves right now, right this very moment, and be reborn, be reborn into a child of the Most High God. You do that simply by saying, Dear Jesus, but mean it in your heart. Dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to change. I can't do it on my own. I need your power, the same power that resurrected you from the dead. I need that power living in me. I pray you will come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior from this point on. And help me follow you every day and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. All right, let's all stand. We're going to do our last, next to last song. If anybody needs prayer for anything, let us pray for you.